when Megan Fontanella, who's the curator of the exhibition here and the uh, curator of modern art at, at the Guggenheim, was putting together her show in 21-22, which was really an attempt to, as they do reasonably often at the Guggenheim, but not for some time, really look at the kind of depth of Kandinsky's career. Uh, we talked earlier then about what would be possible for Sydney and how much of that extraordinary show could come. And there are certain elements that we can't, that can't travel for bequest reasons or for condition reasons, but we really managed to have this extraordinary heart of the oil paintings of Kandinsky. This is a little unusual for us here in, in this show too, because 40 years ago, we had a similar number of works, but most of the show was watercolour, small pieces, works on paper, but to actually have the paintings here all together from 1900 through to 1944 is quite something. It's unbelievable. And it's so interesting to see the trajectory of uh, Kandinsky's mm. career because he started off as a lawyer. Yes, <laughs> He indeed. didn't start painting till he was 30. No, indeed. And it's interesting because on reading some of his biographical texts and there are a couple of key ones that he's he alludes to an absolute love of color and a kind of box of paints much like Matisse in fact he had a you know a kind of an epiphany of the way that colors related to each other in the box you know and the sense of the harmonizing of different colors of what red felt like when it was next to blue versus red sitting next to yellow he actually talks about a memory of that from very young but I think the, the thought of pursuing the life of an artist was just, you know, it wasn't part of his, um, his upbringing as a well brought up, highly educated young man who would have been expected to go to university to do what he did, law and economics. Um, but it was clearly there, there was something in his past that he just wasn't allowing himself to, to proceed with. And so by the time he's 30, he's already decided he's going to abandon his PhD dissertation. He's already been brought into the academic world and he sort of decides no and he takes himself off to a printing company, you know, fine art printing company and starts to work there. And then it's almost as though, right, what if I'm going to do this? You know, but he do, does have two very key moments um, just before he turns 30, and um, and we can we can talk about yeah, what I they think, were. Well, I think one of them was Monet's haystack. He was so a visiting show of French painting in Moscow, and he sees one of the haystacks. And what I find interesting is not so much that he just saw something that he loved and thought he might become an artist. Something very profound and typical of Kandinsky. What really became apparent to him was that the haystack was this form that he didn't even quite recognize. And so what interested him was not just the beauty of Monet, it was this abstract shape that he'd lost a sense of what it was in the world. He didn't recognize it as a haystack. He recognized it as this strange thing and realized that maybe the objective world could be dispensed with and that painting could be about something entirely other could be about colour and the emotional response, which is extraordinary. That's so interesting. And yeah, what was beautiful. the second? Um... Oh, the second was in the same year. So in 1896, um, he also managed to see uh, a performance of the 1850 um, opera Lohengrin by Wagner. And there are all sorts of things about the Wagner performance that excited him. Something of a slight, you know, his tendency to looking at synesthesia, you know, whether it's an actual condition for him or, or just an area of real interest. So he starts to hear um, and see colours while he's listening to the music. There's also something else about Wagner, which is that Wagner is one of the the artist who, who really um, defines the idea of the synthesis of art. And I think that performance probably appealed to Kandinsky too because it was all about the staging. It was all about the look of it, the feel of it, or everything that surrounded the music, the words and the music going together. So that idea of synthesis also really emerges then and he finds that terribly exciting um, mm. through that performance quite an intellectual approach to his work. Mm. Um, he, he was involved with the Bauhaus School. Can you tell me a bit about how that 
you feel that might have influenced his work? Yeah, I mean, he was headhunted, which is really interesting in a way. While he was working um, with the, the kind of new regime in Russia after the revolution, and he was really a contributor to, to um, the academic world. You know, he was helping found new museums in socialist Russia. Um, he had tried to reform a home for himself after being kicked out of Germany effectively at the beginning of the war. And he'd sort of struggled with that relationship with the Russian avant-garde painters. And when he had an opportunity to do some research as an academic in the fine arts department, go to, to Germany, he, um, he was, you know, Gropius invited him and said we could get Kandinsky, who'd already made a name for himself in Russia as a teacher and as a, a real figure in, the, in arts administration. But the, in terms of the effect of the Bauhaus, you know, I think he found there a place that was very much like his early thinkings when he arrived in Munich. Within a couple of years of being in Munich, he had actually formed groups, artist groups like Phalanx, you know, and showing with artists, forming a sense of an art school. And it was one that believed in the synthesis of the arts again. It was the synthesis of traditional crafts, of, um, of drama and theatre, meeting with painting, for example, and having this lovely kind of sense of immersion in, in a wider world of the arts. Of course, the Bauhaus, that was their aim. Their aim also was to be an art college that spoke about synthesis. Um, how, to, how do you have a, you know, Kandinsky headed up the wall painting <laughs> course, for example, and he also headed up the analysis of form course. So here was somebody who was already, as you suggest, deeply interested in the analysis of the elements of painting. And here suddenly was this wonderful opportunity after years in Russia where he didn't quite feel his creative homeland was, his spiritual homeland was there, but his creative homeland in a way was in Germany. So when he has that opportunity to explore exactly that terrain that he loves and to contribute, because he's a great contributor to what the Bauhaus was and what it still stands for today, then that really allowed him to explore this new moment where he, to put it simplistically, moves from a colour focus of analysis to an analysis of form and line, and it is a very dramatic sort of, and yet subtly nuanced um, transition, I think. Mm, and we can see in so many of these works that geometry yes. that is coming yes. through and the circle yes. uh, that he was interested in so mm. much. Can you tell me a bit about his approach to that side of his work? Mm, well, I think they're, they're forms that are elemental, of course, and that in itself is in, of interest to him. But I also think they had already become certainly the circle, but, but very much so um, the triangle as well, had become forms that carried a kind of deep symbolic force for him and an understanding. So where early in his career we know that the horse and rider, for example, was a really amazing metaphor for him of the artist prophet who could carry, you know, carry society away with it, that sort of became the circle in a way. Um, it, it almost literally went through a transfiguration. You can see it in this show in various areas. Almost a closing of forms and suddenly to replace that early motif, we get the circle as a symbol of harmony and of balance. Um, it's also the symbol that takes us to an understanding of the spiritual realm, you know, an awareness. And then for him, the triangle was the same. So it's almost reducing things down to their elemental structure in the way that different cultures have done for millennia. And the, the triangle also becomes a really potent symbolic force for him, sort of symbolising how almost the avant-garde, the idea that you can push through, an artist can push through and lead society, and the triangle becomes a form that represents that sort of structure. So he, it, they're not, it's not just geometry, Kandinsky. Um, it's geometry with content. Yes, yes. And it's interesting you said about the avant-garde because, you know, he's considered one of the pioneers of abstract yeah. art. Yeah. So he must have been... I mean, I'm, I don't know if you thought about this, but mm. he must have been a certain sort of type of character yes. to actually... We, just, just, we, we were talking with some people this morning, Megan and I, and I think one realises how charismatic he must have been because he's deeply studious, he's absolutely committed. Once he makes that commitment to, to become an artist, it's absolute. 
But it's very clear that everywhere he was, from the earliest days in Munich throughout his life, he was seen as a sort of leader. And even though in Paris in his late, late life, he is very much more alone as an artist, but he's engaging with the surrealist community around him. But what I find even more interesting in terms of his character is they, they fate him. You know, he, to them, is a figure of really, they're reverential towards Kap Kandinsky. Breton speaks of him in the most extraordinary terms. So even though Kandinsky holds himself a little aloof from them, there's a sense that they recognise this, this quality of the kind of perhaps father figure to some, certainly a senior artist, certainly someone they respect. And we've kind of seen that time and again. So over some 40 years, it's almost like he's always the natural born leader in the group and the community around him. So Megan Fontanella and I have talked very much about not wanting to suggest he is the father of abstraction. I mean, aside from the gender issue, there's a it's problematic. So many people were looking at that. So many cultures for millennia have dealt with abstraction in different ways. He does not stand alone. He's in community with other artists exploring that. And yet there's something in his character clearly where he seems to be the one who draws out so many of the threads. He's the one who theorises those ideas. And he really clearly is, is a figure um, for other artists. Yeah.